Good morning. Good morning to those who are in the Edinburgh hearing room and good morning to those who are following proceedings on the live stream. Uh, now, Mr. McGregor, I think we're in a position to lead. Is it Mr. Circus? Yes, Mr. Sir, first, Mr. Circus, Mr. As our first witness. Good morning, Mr. Good morning. Circus. Um, as you know, you're about to be asked questions by Mr. McGregor, the counsel to the inquiry. But first, I think you're prepared to take meals. Yes, I am. Sitting where you are, if you would raise your right hand, please, uh, and repeat these words mm -hmm. after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That I will tell the truth. That I will tell the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sarkis. Now, I don't know how long um, your questioning uh, will take, um, but if we will plan to take a coffee break about half past 11. Okay. If for any reason you want to take a break at any time, just say so and we can do that. Okay, thank you. Right. Mr. McGregor. Thank you. You're Paul Sarkis, is that correct? I am indeed. And you've provided a witness statement to the inquiry, Mr. I Sarkis. have, yes. You should have a paper copy available to you if you want to refer to it at yep. any point. Equally, any document I want to take you to should come up on the large screens in front of you. If for any reason you can't see those documents, please just do let me know. Okay. Um, for anyone that's following the electronic bundles, Mr. Sarkis's statement is in bundle 13 from pages 319 to 334. Mr Sarkis, your, your statement is going to form part of your evidence to inquiry, and I'm also going to ask you some, some questions today. If we could just begin with your career, you tell us at paragraph two of your statement that you've been involved in the construction industry for approximately 34 years, is that correct? It is, yes. And you currently work as a project director for an organisation called ISG? Yes, uh, recently just... Um taken on another appointment, which is, I'm still at ISG, but now running all of the film and high-end television sector in terms of the film and media and projects that we're now delivering, so looking after all of those as well. Okay, so that was really what I was going to ask you. Firstly, what, what does ISG do as an organisation? So ISG is a construction company as well, main contractor in its own right, with a turnover of about £2.5 billion a year. Okay. And within ISG, what's your current role? So now I'm uh, the sector director for all the film and high-end television studios that we're building. Okay. Uh, but originally you qualified as a quantity surveyor, is that correct? Correct, yes. Uh, and then moved on to do other roles, including management roles, but all really within the construction sector? Correct, that's correct. So if I could take you back to 2005, whenever you joined Multiplex as a commercial director for their public and private projects, you just explain to the inquiry, what, what did that role involve? So um, when I joined Multiplex, it was to get involved in, um, at the time, sort of PFI projects for healthcare projects that were being built out. Uh, and my role was from a commercial point of view, my background being surveying. Uh, and then I've gone into the sort of commercial director role and looking after the contracts and the, the money sides of the projects that we were looking at. Uh, bidding, getting involved in the in the pretenders, and then taking those through to financial close. Okay. So just so I'm understanding this, you're involved in <coughs> PFI projects, but effectively from the, the management side, as opposed to being involved in any of the aspects of the, the technical construction issues? But yeah, pretty much so, because I was bringing the teams together um, and using my expertise that I'd built up over doing PFI schools when I was doing uh, uh, those at a previous company called Waits, and I got involved in not only the delivery side, but also the front-end side as well. So I had a, a good understanding of how Pier 5 projects were put together. And just to be clear, what do you mean by that, the, the front-end side? What so would the front-end be as opposed to the, the back-end? Yeah, so the, the front-end bit was uh, when you identify an opportunity and a project, you put a pre-qualification together, you bring a team together, you, you put that pre-qualification in, hopefully you get selected and then you go into what's called preferred bidder stage, and then you take that through to financial close. And at financial close, the design and build element starts, uh, and the rest of the 
project is delivered out. So from a construction point of view, uh, I'd been on both sides where I'd gone through from, from what we call cradle to grave, where I'd started bidding and then finished off from a delivery point of view, from a construction point of view, a number of school projects. So that's the differentiation between front end being up to financial close and then delivery beyond that. So front end to financial close and then back end from a contractor's point of view from that point until you Correct. finally complete the, complete the project. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Now, you mentioned in your statement that you worked at Multiplex for 16 years. Were you in, effectively, their healthcare team for the entirety of the time you were with Multiplex? Uh, quite a lot of the time. So when I started, um, a bit of background, having done sort of PFI schools, I saw the healthcare sector as the, the sort of next, I saw it as a Premier League, um, moving into delivering uh, healthcare. And so I then went into looking at healthcare projects with Multiplex initially and probably did that for a good sort of 10 years. Uh, and then went into the uh, operations side and then started looking after other projects like offices and residential um, and that side of it. And you give us some examples of projects that you'd worked on. So you mentioned that you worked in the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in, in Glasgow. Again, just in general terms, can you explain what your involvement was in, in that project? Yeah. So that, that project was slightly different to, to the NPD model that we have on, on Edinburgh. That was a capital expenditure project, so there were less um, stakeholders involved. And my role was there as the uh, commercial director for the project, and I again took that from the initial uh, pre-qualification stage through to financial close. I also stayed on uh, for a year while we were setting the team up uh, and setting up the project because one part of the project had started being the FM building, and then the rest of the main adult and children's hospital was going to be started a year later. So I was then involved in that transition year as well. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned in your statement from effectively 2000 onwards that you had an involvement and interest in PFI contracts. Now, am I right in thinking that they're structured effectively so that private capital can be used to finance public sector projects? And you mentioned within your statement at paragraph nine that it's really like paying for a facility through a mortgage. Again, for those of us that don't work in that sector, can you just explain in, in very simple terms yeah. what you mean by that and, and how the project's structured? Yeah, certainly. So um, with, with a PFI model, you're effectively allowing a project to be built using finance from uh, investors at that time. And then the, the NHS trust or, or the board will pay that money back over a period of time. Um, and so it allows projects, if there isn't um, private uh, investment, to tap into pro private, sorry, public investment, that you tap into private investment, and then that money is paid back over a long duration. It might be 25 years, it could be 30 years, 35 years, depending on what the, the tenure is that the, the trust or board wish to do, or school if it's a PFI school. And just in, in terms of how the project would be structured. You, you cover some of this in, in your statement, but you mentioned a, a number of, of players that would be involved. So there's the special purpose vehicle or the company. What is that and, and why is it formed? So for, for each project, uh, a special purpose vehicle, an SPV or, or special purpose company, SPC, is set up, and that's the contracting body with the, the trust or the board or the school. And they are effectively the lead that once construction is complete, you still have that link between... Uh, the delivery of that project and then the ongoing tenure for, for 20, 25 years after the construction period. And they organise um, and sometimes put in a, a bit of equity. So they might put, typically they might put 10% equity in and the balance of that 90% investment, they go out and they source from um, other, other investment vehicles and they bring all that funding in uh, and then have the, the, the model, financial model that basically sets out how this is going to be paid back over the 25 or 30 years. So the, the company's set up effectively so that the private capital can go in and then the company would contract with the public sector organisation such Correct. as the health board? Yeah. Okay. So if we think, we'll, we'll come on and talk about the project for the Royal Hospital for Children and Young People in the yep. Department of Clinical Neurosciences. If I refer to the project at any point, that, that's what I'm referring okay. to. We've heard evidence about integrated health solutions, though they in IHSL. Is, is IHSL the, the SPV or the, or the company that was formed? Correct, it is, yeah. And in terms of other entities that, that we hear about, so you, you work for Multiplex. Where does Multiplex sit and what's it doing 
relevant to IHSL. Yeah, okay. So Multiplex was the design and build contractor, so you have the SPV or SPC, which was uh, IHSL in this instance. You have the main contractor who are doing the design and build contract, which was Multiplex. And then you had Bouygues in this instance doing the facilities management uh, and the uh, life cycle maintenance. And then they contracted direct with IHSL and there was an interface agreement between Multiplex and Bouygues, who were the FM side of it. So once the job's built, Bouygues would then take on the facilities management uh, and have obligations through the SPV, SPC in this instance, through to uh, NHS Lothian. And again, just so I'm understanding things, because often at times IHSL and Multiplex can get lumped together, but just in terms of strict technicalities, you've got IHSL as, as the entity that's going to put the bid in and then you have Multiplex as the design and build contractor Correct. sitting as a separate entity, but doing the key aspect of the project, the design and build of the hospital, if IHSL is successful in the tender process. Correct, yes. I think you mentioned within your, your statement that you'd worked on standard PFI or PPP projects before. The project was going to be a, an NPD project, which you say is similar similar but slightly different to, yep. to a, a standard PFI or PPP project. Can you just explain in general terms your understanding, what, what's the difference with an NPD project? So the, the, just the terminology of, of NPD is, is non-profit distribution. So um, whereas a, a PFI model, there would be uh, more of a return of investment for the equity stakeholders. Uh, from an NPD point of view, it was less money going back into the private sector. Effectively, the same structure, Pretty much, just yeah. the amount of money that may flow is, is different, perhaps capped as opposed to a standard yeah. PFI PPP project. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Just uh, again, drawing on your experience working within revenue-funded projects, did you have a, an appreciation of, of where would design risk generally sit if one's dealing with that type of, of project whereby you've got a procuring authority and they want a private sector organisation to come in and build a project for them that will be paid back over a number of years. What, what was your understanding as a generality of where design risk would sit in a project like that? So uh, as a generality, you have uh, the risk that is passed down from the contracting uh, board or uh, um, NHS trust or board and that would then be passed down to the SPV company. And in turn, under the project agreement, which is the main agreement between the SPV and the client, they would step down, whether it's the DMV obligation. So in this instance, the design and build obligations would step down to multiplex. And the FM facilities management obligations would be stepped down to uh, Buig in this instance. Again, just so I'm understanding this, as, as a generality design risk would be passed from the, the public sector to the private sector. Right. But in terms of exactly how any deal is structured, presumably that depends on the individual procurement exercise and the individual contract. Correct, yeah. Working within that sector, were you familiar with the term operational functionality? Was that, that an industry-wide term that you were aware of? Yeah, I mean, uh, as an as a experience, operational functionality is, is about how the building is going to uh, work, how it's going to be used, um, all the different departments um, and how they integrate with each other. Um, and there is links to how those rooms in, in a particular building will be used. Uh, and so the design of those rooms will influence, um, for example, if you had a, uh, a, a four bed ward or, or a single bed ward, um, the operational functionality of, of that particular ward uh, would be passed down to the design and build contractor to start with to make sure that it's built in accordance with the requirements. And then from an operational point of view, that would then switch to facilities management team who would then manage and make sure that those rooms are functionally, operationally wise, they all work and they're all maintained properly. Thank you. If I can ask you to, to have your statement in front of you, please. It's, it's bundle 13, page 322 and paragraph 14. So bundle 13, page 322, paragraph 14. Yep. You see the, the sentence beginning, to be successful in a bid, you've got to get the money right to start with. Yep. 
again, for those of us that don't operate in that, say, what do you mean about getting the money right to start yeah. with? So you've, you've got to be competitive. Uh, and by that, I mean um, the, the project will have uh, a certain amount that they can spend. So if you go back to uh, the, the mortgage concept, you'll have a certain amount of money that they can afford. And so if your positioning in terms of your submission isn't there, i.e., you haven't got the, the design and build cost, the operational cost, and the, and the finance cost through the financial model in the right ballpark, and that's I'll probably use my words, the money right, as in that the, the, the cost to the trust or the board that they will have to pay back, if that's not right, then generally you don't get considered. And within the project, there was a 60-40 split in terms of price to quality. That's how tenders were going to be assessed. Were you surprised to see that split in, in the tender documents? Um, I wouldn't say I was surprised. I mean, it, every project um, has a, a, a difference. You know, no project is the same. There's no uh, panacea for every single project. So you might see different weightings depending on, on different projects. We come on perhaps just to ask you some, some more specific questions about the project itself. Sure. You've explained that Multiplex were in as the design and, and build contractor. You also mentioned that Macquarie were involved. What, what was Macquarie's role? Who, who are they and what was their role? So Macquarie, uh, they were part of the SPV or SPC in this instance. So they were uh, putting up some of the equity. Um, so they were acting as the lead across the whole of this project. Um, we'd worked with Macquarie's in the past, uh, having done Peterborough Hospital. Uh, in, in the same vein, they were um, part of the equity funding uh, and part of the SPV on Peterborough. So there was a working relationship with them. And when we were looking at opportunities, uh, we were talking about um, the various opportunities that uh, were available to for us to work together again. And Edinburgh was one of them that came up previously. It was, a, I think, it was under the Scottish framework, so it wasn't that was on our radar. And then late, later on, it became a, an NPD model, uh, in which case that was a, an attraction for both Macquarie and ourselves to to get involved because at the time, Multiplex weren't on the, uh, the Scottish framework. And in terms of the, the tender that's put together on behalf of IHSL, can you just explain a bit about who's leading on that and who's having involvement? Is it Macquarie, IHSL? Is it Multiplex or is it a combination of, of everyone? What, what's happening? So as a, as a lead, Macquarie would, would uh, manage the whole of IHSL Lothian. So they would lead on behalf of the whole consortium and they would pull everything together. Uh, we would feed in our design and build elements as, as Multiplex and Boeig would feed in their uh, facilities management elements, and then Macquarie's would pull all of that together and make the submission. Tell us within your statement, you were working with a Mr. John Ballantyne. Who, who's he and what was his role in the project? So John, uh, I knew for a few years after, off the back of uh, the Glasgow hospital that we did, uh, we employed John, um, and the intention was that John, uh, being based in Scotland, uh, would, would effectively run the, the project as the project director for uh, Edinburgh and so I was working with him to effectively bring all my experience and, and my knowledge uh, and bring the teams together uh, with the view that at financial close I would then finish up and, and head back down to, to London to go and pursue other projects and that would then allow John to take on and deliver the, the project itself. Again just so I'm understanding things you're working with Mr Ballantyne you both work for Multiplex would it be fair to say that he's working at a slightly more granular level of detail in the project and, and you're perhaps dealing with a slightly higher level in the project? Uh, to be honest, we, we both rolled our sleeves up and got stuck in. Uh, John, when I say stuck in, it, it was, you know, we were working as a team. Uh, I was supporting John with the full knowledge that I would then head back after financial close. So, um, you know, we, we tried share share the load. Um, but ultimately, it was going to be John's responsibility to deliver the project. So he was taking a keen interest in, in everything that, that we were doing as a team and everything that, that Boeig and um, Macquarie's were doing as the, uh, the SPV, SPC. And again, just so I'm understanding your role, you're really looking at the, the commercial side of the tender that's being put together, is that correct? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, and bringing the interface between the design and build and the FM side of it as well. Because, you know, various points in your statement, you, you touch upon issues such as the board construction requirements, the tender documents, and, and 
as I understand you very fairly say, you had a, a fairly high level superficial understanding, but it, it wasn't really your role to have the, the detailed understanding of, of that technical information. Is that fair? It, it's fair, yeah. I, um, you know, I, I take an interest in, in all sort of procurement models. Uh, I'd like to understand the documents, what the makeup is, how they all go together. Um, but if someone was to, to ask me detail by detail, there are, we have a team and that, that's how jobs are built with the team. And again, this, this is really a statement in, in fairness to you. At some points in your statement, you've, you've helpfully tried to set out your understanding of various documents, your understanding of, of the contract, but presumably you recognise that those views may be controversial and you're not seeking to give a definitive view. You're simply saying that's your subjective understanding of, of various matters to try and put your views in context. Is that right? Correct, yeah. Thanks. In relation to the, the tender itself goes in from IHSL, did, did you have any responsibility for drafting any particular aspect of that or, or did that really sit with, with IHSL and, and other specialist technical people? So if it would sit ultimately uh, with IHSL as, as the driver, um, but obviously Multiplex would be feeding in uh, from a design and build point of view uh, and we from an FM point of view. So we'd be collectively feeding documents into, excuse me, feeding into the overall submission, whether it was the pre-qualification or the um, during the preferred bidder stage to get to financial close. Thank you. Now, within your, your statement, you talk about the relationships and the project. I, as I understand that, that's the relationships between individuals at IHSL and Multiplex with those acting for NHS loading, including Mott McDonald. Now, you tell us at paragraph 21 of your statement that you considered the working relationships were, were challenging and you considered that fatigue had set in on the part of, of I think, NHSL loading in, in particular. Can you just explain what you mean by that and, and when you thought the relationship was began to be challenging and when you thought that fatigue had set in? Yeah, if, if I go back to um, when I sort of first understood about the project, so as, as I understood it, that the project sat originally on the, the Scottish framework uh, and had been in circulation for some time. And I think... Uh, it was around about 2010. Um, well, the records will show when exactly it was, but it then transitioned uh, across to an NPD model, uh, and that's when then we got involved. So my, my point there is that there would have been a number of people involved uh, with that project before it even got to financial close. Um, and, and my view was um, I'm used to sort of building teams together, driving teams together, and bringing those relationships together. And I just felt very early on that there was the, – the, the reason I use fatigue is because this project had been um, in circulation for, for a few years uh, and it hadn't reached financial close. And my own personal view was that um, I believe fatigue had set in on the basis that a number of people were, just wanted to get this across the line, get it to financial close and just move on and, and get it built. Um, hence why the sort of fatigue statement is – my, my view was that some people were just tired of it and just wanted to, to get on to financial close and move on because it had been around for a while. If we think about the competitive dialogue stage, so IHSL gets through the pre-qualification, yep. invited to competitive dialogue, what input and engagement was there from clinicians with IHSL Multiplex and Multiplex's subcontractors? Uh, during the, the, the period of... Uh, competitive dialogue, um, I don't recall there being, certainly I didn't attend any meetings with any clinicians, uh, and I don't recall there being any intense meetings to look at, at the design with them. It, did that surprise you, given similar projects you'd worked on before? It, it did, and, and I think I, I put it in my statement about, uh, you know, we're used to getting involved uh, from a design and build point of view to help um, shape and... Uh, bring all the different experiences that we have to the delivery of, of facilities. Um, now, there's no right or wrong answer as to how you design a hospital, but there are, are standards and there are uh, documents out there that will, depending on what the board or the NHS trust would like, um, you then develop that with the clinicians, with um, other user groups and stakeholders, so that ultimately you get to a position where the hospital that's being built is something that they want and is future-proofed going forward. And 
That's the competitive dialogue. What about from the point IHSL gets appointed as preferred bidder? Was there more clinical input with um, Multiplex and Multiplex's subcontractor in the, in the period from preferred bidder to financial close? No, not that I was aware of. Um, again, I did find it strange that there wasn't more interaction. And, and you'll, you'll see, you'll probably come onto it in my statement, but that it was, I just got the impression that just go and build what we've designed and move on. Because, uh, again, the inquiry will hear evidence from individuals from Wallace Whittle, TUV Suit, who were subcontractors and yeah. bees. They, they said that they thought there was very little clinical engagement and that wasn't something that they had really anticipated in a project of that nature. Were you having any discussions with Wallace Whittle, TUV Suit, about the lack of, of clinical engagement? I, I don't recall any specific conversations other than I, I did sort of turn around to John on several occasions saying this is, this is going to be hard because they just don't want to change anything or, or consider any, uh, any changes or any, not so much changes but any views that we may bring with the expertise that we've got um, as having delivered a number of hospitals and bringing the team together that we have. And that probably feeds into my sort of fatigue statement that just we've done the design, it's, it's a mandatory design, this is what we want. Please just deliver it. Okay. But again, your position is it effectively, as, as you understood it, there was a, a fixed brief of something that had to be built out by IHSL or Multiplex. Correct, correct? yeah. If we could just ask you to have your statement in front of you, of you, please. Bundle 13, page 325. And we'll come on to look at, at paragraph 27 in a minute. But I don't think it's a matter of dispute that the procuring authority, NHS Lothian, hadn't produced room data sheets to provide to bidders as part of the procurement exercise. Given your experience on projects of this nature, were you surprised not to see a full suite of room data sheets being provided to tenderers? No, no, not at all. Um, the, the, again, there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's just where people are in, in the process. Uh, on some projects, uh, there will be room data sheets that are quite advanced, and other projects, there are very little. You might have some typical... Uh, room data sheets for some of the rooms and then beyond financial close you then very quickly develop those finish those off with the uh, with the client's team okay. and there's an environmental matrix that is provided to prospective tenders is that the document that your view was that that was effectively a brief that had been provided to, to tenders yeah i mean the, the environmental matrix set the parameters uh of of, of what that brief was um and Effectively, that's, that's what the, the board were looking for, uh, to be delivered. And in terms of that being what the board's are looking for, could that design brief be frozen at the tender stage or, or would it have to have been developed on a project of this nature? So you, you could freeze it. Um, again, there's, there's no right or wrong way to do this. It, it's what, at the, you know, with the documents in front of you, with how much design has been done, with how much interaction with the clinicians has been done. It's about uh, an understanding of the environmental matrix will set the parameters. You then delve down into each room. And I, and I think I go on to give an example where if you, if you have a floor plate in here where you've already got the rooms laid out and, and, and designed, uh, and then there's a change to say, well, actually, we want to increase one of those rooms in there. You've still got the same floor plate, which means you might have to change some of the room data sheets to suit uh, those rooms. So if we, if we look at, at paragraph 27, the, the final couple of sentences, yeah. you say it's very difficult to finalise those room data sheets until you absolutely have cast iron 100% design freeze for that room. There's no, room, room. there's no rule for when this will happen, but typically it's, it's after financial close. What was your understanding of, of what was happening on, on the project? When, when was there going to be design freeze? So for, for Edinburgh... Um... I can't exactly remember when, but I know that, uh, in, in my view, it should have been post-financial close. Um, but, you know, re going back and reading some of the documents, uh, there was a will to have everything uh, done and, and complete before financial close. Um, and, you know, with the, with the best will in the world, if you had a, a high-performing team, that might have been achieved. And by that, I mean everyone working collectively together. Uh, when you've got a, a, a mix of people, going back to the word fatigue, um, going back to the relationship with, with everyone, um, you know, looking back now, uh, there's probably reasons why it wasn't achieved. 
we can just think then about, a bit more about the, the tender exercise. Wallace Whittle, TUV sued, and, and Mr McKechnie in particular are engaged effectively as specialists at ventilation subcontractors, is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So what did Multiplex ask Wallace Whittle, TUV sued, to do it at the tender stage, so up to the point that IHSL submits their tender, what, what were they being asked to do? So they would have been asked to review uh, the documentation uh, that's been put in front of us, that's been uh, issued to all of the tenderers, uh, and then once you move into, obviously, um, the period between uh, preferred bidder and financial close is to work with the, the client's team and their advisors to close out whatever the delivery, the deliverables are to, to meet financial close. In, in terms of if we think about specifically the environmental matrix, if Multiplex consider that was a, a fixed client brief, at the tender stage, would Mr McKechnie and Wallace Whittle TUV sued, would they have been asked to review that document to see if there was compliance with the values in it with various items of, of published guidance? Yes, they would have done, yeah. Okay. It, it's just Mr McKechnie, he says in, in his witness statement he's going to give evidence tomorrow that at, at that stage the period up to preferred bidder, that they hadn't conducted any form of review of the environmental matrix. Right, okay. Is that a surprise to you? Uh, well, if, if he's saying he hasn't, then, then it is a bit of a surprise, but notwithstanding that, um, at a point in time, they would have looked at it. So whether it was before the commercial dialogue period or between um, preferred bidder and financial close, uh, those documents uh, would have been reviewed by them at some point. Now, whether they did it before the, the prequel or, or after the prequel submission, um, but before financial close. The, the reason I raise that with you, and I appreciate you didn't put the tender together and yeah. you're not au fait with all of the technical details, but there, there's various points within IHSL's tender whereby their statement saying we will comply with published guidance such as yeah. Scottish Health Technical Memorandum 0301. I'd just be interested to know what was the basis for, for those statements? And if you don't know, please do just say. But there are various statements we could go to that says our tender will comply with, with the published guidance. Do, do you know what the genesis of those statements in, in the tender bid was? Uh, I don't, to be honest. Perhaps if we could just think a, a little bit more about the status of the environmental matrix. And, and you tell us within your statement, it might be worth just looking on to, to paragraph 28, I think it is. Um, so bundle 13, page 325. There's, there's a sentence um, about halfway down beginning, they, ha they had a reference design. You see that? So I think it's, it's just the, the very final line that's on the big screen at the minute. It says they had a reference. Yep. Maybe if we could just scroll up slightly. Yep. Or sorry, scroll down, scroll down so that we yeah. can see more, more of the text. Yeah, that's fine. You, you tell us they had a reference design and we were being told, don't change any of it, just get on with it and deliver it. We don't want anything else. This is my firm recollection of what we were being told by the board and their advisors, Mark McDonald. They just said, this is what we want. We spent enough time modelling this. We've met with the user groups. We've met with the clinicians. Please don't change it, just deliver what we want. Do you see that? Yes. And then the, the final sentence, you say, by this, I meant we would need to meet the requirements set out in the briefing document, such as the EM. Do you see that? Yep. Uh, again, I appreciate this is nearly 10 years ago, but can you just try to explain why, why you're telling us? Who's telling you this? What are they telling you? And when are they telling you? Yeah, okay. I mean, I can't remember exactly who said it. Um, but the feeling I got from pretty much all the meetings that I attended uh, was, and this goes back to, and I'm sorry I keep going back to it, but the project was, was uh, originally put together back in 2010. A lot of work had been done uh, to, to get that project to the market. You then had the DCN that was added to the project. I can't remember the exact time, but that was added to the project as well. And that's when it switched to the NPD model. My, my point in all, all of this was I just generally got the feeling for everything that was being said to us is, we've done all this, please don't change it, just get on and deliver what we want. And that was it. And is your recollection that you were being told, this is what we want, 
as in all that's set out in the tender documents is what we want? Or, or do you remember specific discussions around the environmental matrix? That's what we want. No, uh, uh, there was, there was no, I don't recall any specific conversations that certainly that I attended in relation to the environmental matrix. And I suppose what I would go on to say is no one ever raised it as being a, a major issue. Um, if it was a, a major issue, I'm sure John and I would have would have dealt with it. Um, but again, you know, you've seen what, I, what I've put down in my witness statement. My, my feeling was that and from experience of all the other PFI projects, and even indeed other projects not PFI, it was, we've done all this, this is what we want, please go and deliver it. The reason I, I raise this is because I think views differ on what was being said at the time. So, for example, okay. Mr Greer, who the inquiry is going to hear from on Friday, according to his witness statement, he really disputes that he was having any conversations like that. His recollection is that what IHSL were being told that was that the requirement was for them to ensure that documents like the environmental matrix complied with published guidance. But do you recall any conversations like that with Mr. Greer or anyone else from, from Mott McDonald or NHS Lothian? No. As I say, if, it, if someone had raised this as a major issue, uh, I'm pretty certain that John and I would have dealt with it. Did you attend the, the bidder's day for the project? Uh, oh, crikey. Um, I can't remember whether I attended the actual bidders' day. Um, I certainly attended all of the sort of meetings and put help put the prequel together. Um, I'll need to double check on that. I, I, I take it there's, yeah. there's some documentation relating to the bidders' day, but it would be fair from what you're saying that yeah. it's a long time ago. Yeah, and I've, any specifics. I've been to you... a lot of bidders' days, which is why apologies. Um, I, I can check that and come back to you. No, no, it, it's yeah. fine because there's certain documentation from the bidder's day, but if you don't have a re recollection of the day, yeah. there's no point in me asking right. you any, any <laughs> questions about it. So if, if you don't recollect, please do just say. Yeah, okay. I don't recollect okay. me. Then. Thank you. So a few more questions about the, about the, the status of, of the environmental matrix. Were you aware of the fact that Wallace Whittle TUV sued Mr McKechnie had, had asked for an, an Excel spreadsheet version of the in, environmental matrix? Did that ever come up in any discussions you had with them? Uh, I'm obviously reading the documents now. Uh, I'm aware. Um, going back at the time, I can't recall, again, having any detailed conversations about the environmental matrix with them. Okay, I'll just I'll turn up the reference in, in fairness yeah. to you. Uh, so if, if we could look at it, bundle 10, please, volume 2, and page 1,300. So bundle 10, volume 2, page 1,300. Do you see the, the second email there? So it's, it's an email from a, from a Ken Hall to, to Maureen Brown and Graham Greer? Yeah. Uh, do you know Ken Hall? Yes, yeah, he worked for Multiplex. He was one of our uh, M&A managers. And what he says is, good morning, most wrote Graham. Stuart has asked me if he could have the environmental matrix in Excel rather than PDF version allowed to populate the schedule with any changes. Do you see that? Yeah, I can so see that. The, the reason I asked you about whether you're having any discussions with, with Mr McKechnie or, or Wallace Whittle, TUV Sued, it, it might be said if the environmental matrix is a, a fixed brief that can't be changed, why do your ventilation subcontractors want an Excel spreadsheet to, to make changes to that? Do, do you have any observations on that? I suppose my only observation is uh, if, if Stuart, at the end of the day, from a design and build point of view, we need to comply with those documents um, unless there are any changes that are either agreed. Uh, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't just change things for the sake of it. So if there were going to be any changes, uh, then I'm looking at that saying, well, Stuart's obviously... Asked for environmental matrix, and he's asked for it. Or sorry, Ken's asked for it. 
uh, in an Excel form so that they can review that. And if there are any changes agreed with the, with the client, it's populated in that document and then returned back. But I wouldn't say any changes are made without agreement with anyone. That's not, that, that's not in anyone's interest to do that. Okay. And in, from the point that IHSL gets appointed as preferred bidder, are there comments that are coming back on the proposals that have been put forward by NHS Lothian and in particular their lead technical advisors, Mott McDonald Limited? I honestly can't remember or being involved in any detailed discussions on those uh, and don't recall anyone bringing this to my attention that there was a toing and froing between the parties on okay. that. So again, if there was the toing and froing, you don't recall being involved in that? No. And perhaps not surprising if you've got a commercial role and a, a technical role. Yeah. But again, I'd just be interested in your observations. If, if those backwards and forwards are going on, that NHS Lothian and Mott MacDonald are, are making comments on the proposals, do you have any observation on whether that would be relevant to whether the, the environmental matrix was a, a fixed client brief? I suppose my my observation is, you know, 10 years on or, or whatever, is that there was dialogue going on between the parties to make sure that the environmental matrix was um, agreed so that each party knew what was going to be delivered post-financial close. And if we think about what ultimately happens to the environmental matrix, I don't think it's a matter of dispute that it became included in the contract as reviewable design data. Is that your understanding? Correct, yeah. Again, I'd just be interested in your views. If the environmental matrix was a fixed client brief that wasn't to be changed, what was your understanding of why that was included as reviewable design data? Again, my view is you can fix things. Um, and there is a suite of documents that, that will fix what uh, contractors uh, are obliged to deliver as part of the contract. Post-financial close, there is dialogue that continues and there are variations, there are mechanisms in the contracts to affect any change that a client uh, or a contractor might suggest. So while something will be fixed at the point of, of contract execution, the, the suite of documents allows for further uh, variations and changes, but they will need to be agreed between the parties. They don't just get changed um, without any other, any other party knowing. So it's fixed insofar as there are provisions in contracts to allow changes to occur post-financial close. Thank you. I'd now like to move on and, and ask you about a different issue, and that, that was the requirement in the tender documents for the successful tenderer to produce 100% room data sheets for every space in the hostel by financial close. Yeah. So if I could ask you to have in front of you bundle two, page 965, which is part of the invitation to participate in dialogue. So it's bundle two, page 965. You should see a bold heading, 2.5.3 room data sheets. Yep. And if I could ask you just to look to the very final sentence just above 2.6 yeah. indicative elements. Yeah, I can see that. It says the room data sheets will form part of the bidder's proposals. The preferred bidder will be required to complete room data sheets for all remaining rooms prior to financial close. Do you see that? Yeah. Uh, did, did that happen? Did IHSL produce 100% room data sheets by financial close? I don't believe 100% was completed at financial close, no. Why not? Um, I can't answer why they weren't all complete. My 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 opinion at, at the time, and it's easy to look back now. Um, there were so many um, constituent parts that go together when when you're putting these contracts together, and when you are um, working with a, a large group of stakeholders, and with the timing, with everything else uh, that was trying to be put together. Um, I guess that was one element that was uh, agreed between the parties that at some point, and I can't remember when, that they wouldn't be complete by financial close. Because the inquiries heard some evidence to suggest that there came a point in time where either IHSL or, or Multiplex effectively said, you're just asking for too much detail in the time available. 
we're not spending any more money on this and we're not doing any more development, we won't be providing 100% room data sheets by financial close. If those types of conversations were taking place, were you involved in them or would that be other individuals? Uh, there, there was, uh, I, was, I was aware of the pressures on all of the team. Uh, I can't remember individual subjects uh, being discussed about we're doing this, we're not doing this. But the general uh, feeling around the whole of the team, there was... Uh, I suppose there was frustration on 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 all parties. Uh, there was a, there was pressure to get to financial close um, because of, if you start to extend the period of financial close, then it, it, it stands to, to to bear that that all parties are, are expending more money. Um, so when you set a plan in place, so there would have been a, a program that we would have agreed at the time to take the contract from sorry to take the position from preferred bidder through to financial close. And you have a list of all the deliverables and all the actions and all the meetings. Um, sorry, that wasn't me, was it? Um, now, it, again, it's easy to look back 10 years and go, well, every single element of those, um, that was delivered, that wasn't delivered. I guess somewhere along the, along the way, there was an agreement between all parties um, that some of these things wouldn't be complete by financial close. But again, I would add that whilst it says it here that they will be complete by financial close, a lot of projects that I've been involved in, they're not all done by financial close. Again, I'd just be interested in your views. That, that's stated in the procurement documents that go out to all bidders as an absolute requirement that has to be done. Yeah. Were you surprised that NHS, lo L lo NHS loading were prepared to waive that requirement in the period between preferred bidder and financial close? Um. I wouldn't say I'm surprised. Uh, as I say, the when you get to financial close, there will there will always be certain things that still need to be done post financial close. Uh, and the fact that some room data sheets uh, won't be complete. If I go back to my earlier statement about you're still honing and finalising some of the design on the, on the floor plates, or well, that's what you should be doing. Um, because there might be changes uh, in terms of medical provision. There might be changes in the way that floor plate uh, is laid out. So whilst you might have a set of room data sheets and the requirement, I can see this here, it says that it'll all be done by uh, financial close. In this instance, they weren't all complete by financial close. But again, uh, there would have been agreement along the way to accept that all those room data sheets wouldn't be done by financial close and some would tip over beyond financial close. If I could move on and ask you some questions about your understanding of the role of, of McDonald Limited. So in, in the from the point that IHSL gets appointed as, as preferred bidder, were you involved in any of the engagements between IHSL and Multiplex and, and Mock McDonald Limited? Yeah, I attended. Uh, so there was a number of different meetings. Uh, and uh, I think I referenced in my statement about we'd during the preferred bidder stage, we'd all meet at the beginning of the day. Uh, and then um, talk about sort of key issues, what was going to be happening over the course of the day. And then there would be subcommittee meetings going on during the course of the day. Uh, and everyone would go off to their respective meetings. And, and John and I would split ourselves up along with the rest of the team and go and attend some of those meetings. And, and basically just to keep an overall eye that uh, making sure that everyone's doing what they should be doing or bringing any key issues uh, up to uh, to us for us to deal with. And in terms of the intensity of the input from Mott McDonald, the, in the inquiries heard a range of views expressed. Some witnesses from Mott McDonald have suggested for things like the technical solution being put forward, they were just doing a, a sampling approach on that. Mr Hall from Multiplex described Mott McDonald as, as performing a role that was more akin to a shadow design team, very detailed uh, input that was being provided. What was your Im impression of the intensity of the input from Mott McDonald? Uh, I would say it's probably more intense than I'd been used to on, on other projects. Uh, and that's, that's not a criticism, that's just an observation. Um, but what I did find is that if you, if you go to the, the, the project contractors' proposals, the PCPs, uh, which are a response to the all construction requirements, when we were drafting those, um, it did feel, uh, and I sense the frustration from the team, that they were taking um, 
a much more active role in the drafting of those documents uh, and the detail going into those documents than than I've experienced on on many other projects. That's not a criticism. That's just an observation. If I could ask you to have your statement in front of you again, please. So it's, it's bundle thirteen, page three hundred and thirty-one, paragraph forty-six. Page three hundred and thirty-one, paragraph forty-six, and and it's the last couple of sentences beginning. However, from what my recollection was, we maybe just zoom in. Bottom of paragraph forty-six. Yep. Yep, you state, however, what my recollection was, the board and their advisors were going through every item, changing it, not only changing words and grammar, but also changing the fundamentals of what we said in some instances. This was altering the basis of the bid which they had accepted. Do you see that? Yeah. Could you just explain what you mean? What, what fundamentals were they trying to change? So I think in, ter in terms of detail, when, when you put a set of contractors' proposals together, you are responding to the uh, board construction requirements. Uh, and insofar as, if, if you imagine the board construction requirements were written, let's say for argument's sake, 2010. So that was... They were written as an aspirational document. Um, things move, the design changes, the, the design develops, and by the time you get to 2013, 2014, uh, there's been a lot of um, change along the way. And so I suppose my, my point there is that um, they were then trying to take what had moved from the BCRs, the building construction requirements, uh, and any changes that have happened since that document was drafted and feed that into the um, project code proposals. Um, so for me, it was, it was, it was like, um, I think I actually say it somewhere, it was like a teacher marking your homework. Um, and I actually did one of the sections um, because I was trying to help out the team. And I got sort of my version back and, and it was marked like a teacher. Red line, red pen, changes made. I can't remember the exact details, but to me, I, was, I wanted to do that to understand why my team was getting frustrated. Uh, and that was a, a signal for me, that's why. And the PCP took a long time to get resolved. Okay, so you, you make the point fairly that it was being marked up, lots of comments, but you, but you say that NHS Lothian were proposing fundamental changes. The reason I'd like to just drill into that a bit more is it, it might seem surprising that if you've been through an open procurement exercise whereby you've stated your requirements that at this point, at the preferred bidder stage, that there would be attempts to make fundamental changes. Like, can you just try and elaborate on, just give some examples of yeah, what was the I'm, fundamental things that we're yeah, trying to change about the project? I'm trying to think of a, a fundamental change, but off the top of my head, I can't think of an example. And I'm not trying to avoid the question. I'm just trying to think of, at the time, what was going on. Um, I suppose all I would say is, um, in the in the ideal world, you would take the BCRs and you would put them up on a screen and you'd rewrite them so that the BCRs reflect what we're both currently signing up to, rather than drafted in 2010. A lot of changes had happened, um, and so if you Again, I'm not avoiding the question. What I'm trying to get across is that was drafted with a lot of aspirational material in there. The PCPs were being changed to actually put in things that weren't written in the in the BCRs, and I can't think of an example now. Um, um, sorry, I, yeah. I, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, Mr. Circus. Just a small mechanical point. Um, could just. I suspect that uh, Mr. Circus has the wrong paragraph 46 in front of him. Um, I think the page which is on the screen is 331, whereas I think you indicated 231. Um, uh, no, it, it, it was 331, my lord. It was, it was paragraph 46, uh -huh. 331. Um, I did. Okay. It, it was just in case that gives uh, the witness any assistance. I think. I think. Sorry, no. I'm looking at. The, sorry. I, I think certainly, not in my view, we we were looking at, at three three one and, and paragraph forty six on um, three three one or two three one three three one two three one three three one three three one. My okay. Uh, 
just ignore, right. just ignore what <laughs> no, I said. No, 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 that's fine. Just ignore what I said. That's fine. Just to make sure your Lordship has the right <laughs> reference, we were looking at page 331, and it was the final two sentences in paragraph 46, right. beginning, however, from what my recollection was. Thank you. Perhaps if we could just pick up that point about, I think you'd said that the, you're really being told that the, the BCRs were fixed. If we could look on to, to page 332, paragraph 48. See the, the first yeah. two sentences you say, PCPs were our response to the BCRs, essentially setting out how we would deliver what they'd asked for. If I'd had my way, we would have written the BCRs, but they just were not entertaining that at all. Do you see that? Yeah. One thing, and it's no doubt a failing on my part, that I'm, I'm trying to, to understand is, on the one hand, you're telling us that the board were coming back saying board construction requirements are, are fixed. We're not changing those. But equally, you're telling us that NHS Law then wanted to make fundamental changes to your tender. I, I'm just struggling in my own head to knit those those two sections together. Okay, let, let, let me explain that and, and I'll try and do it quite concisely. You've got a set of BCRs and then you've got a set of PCPs. Um, and always, if you have two documents, there is much more of a chance that there will be um, a discrepancy between documents. And my point there is um, if I'd had my way, I'd, I'd rewrite the BCRs. What I've done in the past on other projects that, that's, that's worked well with, with clients is they know when they've written the, uh, um, the, the construction requirements um, that they were, they were written a number of years before. And before financial close, we would sit together in a room and have them up on a screen and we would go through line by line and change some of the wording in those construction requirements on the client's behalf in agreement with ourselves to reflect exactly what it is we are going to provide as a DMB contractor. An example I might give, and this isn't necessarily the contract, but it might be that um, you know all the walls will be painted either grey or black in the BCRs. You then get to financial close and they've agreed they want all the walls grey, so you would change that that document to say all the walls will be grey. Not a very challenging change, but the point is um, the more documents they have, the more chance there are of having discrepancies and the more chance there is of people not knowing what it is they're supposed to be delivering. And then you get into the discussion of hierarchy of documents and what it says in the BCRs, what it says in the PCPs. One interesting one issue I'd be interested in your views in is you, you say effectively the board construction requirements are fixed. The project uh, company proposals are, are there and, and they're being tinkered with. Do you think there was a, a common understanding between the, the parties as to what was to be delivered or at points were people talking at cross purposes? Again, casting my mind back, I think because the relationships weren't as as good as I'd seen in the past on, on other projects. I think there was that nervousness on either side to make sure that, on the one hand, uh, the BCRs weren't changed at all, and that was the document they wanted, but equally that the, the PCPs that, that we were drafting as a, as a, a DMB contractor, um, they were trying to, I suppose, make them make them reflect identically what was in the BCRs. And I know this is, this is slightly contradicting, but my point is that, that it was, they were, and I can't think of examples, but they were changing what we were putting into the PCPs. The reason being, when you draft the PCPs, you respond to the BCR and you say, this is what you've asked for, this is what we're going to give you. Very simple. But from, from reading some of the, the changes that were being made to the PCPs and the expansion of the PCPs and the marking up and the, the, the changing of those, that was where I think the frustration was being born out of uh, the teams that were drafting them. I'd now like to move on and ask you some more questions about the, the period to financial close. So IHSL appointed preferred bidder, work continues, 
Were you aware of any significant issues being raised with the technical solution for the ventilation system in, in the period of the financial crisis? No, and again, had no one sort of raised a red flag to, to myself or John that there was a major issue here. And had they done, I'm pretty sure that, that one of us would have dealt with it. Again, just one document I'd, I'd be interested in your views on. If, if we could look to, to bundle 10... Volume 1 and 2, page 283, please. This is a, a document called Healthcare Associated Infection System for Controlling Risk in, in the Built Environment, HEI Scribe. It's, it's a report from the 19th of November 2014. Do you see that? Yep. Now, before your involvement with the inquiry, had, had you seen this document before? Um. I know of it. I can't say I've read the whole thing. I know, I know obviously, what it stands for and that they're aware of its um, existence. Okay. But if we think back to the period referred bidder to financial close, is this a document that your team were raising with you in terms of any, any issues? I'll be honest, I can't recall any major conversations about it other than it was just another set of documents that were being discussed okay. uh, and, and progressed. If we, if we look on um, perhaps to, to page 285, you'll see the list of, of consultees that attended this. The, the second individual mentions Leanne Scott Edwards, who yep. I think you, you'll know from, from yep, Multiplex. Yeah, she was one of our, yep, she was one of our design managers, yeah. So her evidence to the inquiry was, yes, she attended this, uh, this meeting and, and participated in the, in the HEI scribe yep. process. The reason I draw it to your attention is, is really just over the page onto page 286. You see that there's a box 2.2 at the top of the page. Do you yep. see that? So this, this document, the HEI Scribe Report, states, is the ventilation system design fit for purpose given the potential for infection spread via ventilation systems? And, and you see that that's ticked as, as no. Yeah. I guess the, the, the reason I, I raise that is at this point in time, we're in mid November 2014. Yeah. It seems that NHS Lothian are, are saying that the design proposal for the ventilation isn't, isn't fit for purpose. But am I correct in thinking that isn't something that's being escalated up to, to you on the commercial side of, of Multiplex? I don't, I don't recall any. Anyone raising it as a red flag at the time to me, no. Looking back now, 19th November, NHS loading document saying the design being proposed for the ventilation system isn't fit for purpose. We're talking a couple of months later in February 2015 that we get the financial close. You find it surprising that November system's not fit for purpose. A couple of months later, contract signed is, is there any significance to that in that to you um i mean just reading the comment some concern has been raised in relation to the potential issue in ventilation awaiting further awaiting drawings and further information to fully understand if there is a risk an issue so um i suppose the issue has been raised as something to to review and look at uh, according to this document now as and when that gets done whether that's done before financial close or after financial close. Um, if it's a significant issue, then it, it, it would have been brought to, to mine or, or John's attention. Um, but just reading that comment there, and, and it's, it's easy to look back in hindsight and, and pick out certain things, but the comment there is, is not unusual, awaiting drawings and further information to understand if there is a risk or an issue. That's just part and parcel of another item that would be dealt with as part of the design and build uh, function and, and design development. In terms of the point of financial close, the environmental matrix is included as reviewable design data amongst other reviewable design data. Did you have any particular view on the volume of material that was included at financial close as reviewable design data? Uh, I wouldn't say it was un unusual. Um, again, there is, there is no right or wrong in terms of what information is 
put together at financial close. I've, I've seen projects where some of them are quite lean and then other projects where they're, they're, they're quite sort of detailed. Um, you know, going, going back to what I said earlier on, you, you reach financial close and inevitably there will always be uh, a certain amount of design development and a certain amount of work that we done that will be done post financial close. Um, because you know, with the best one in the world, if you waited till every single document, every single uh, item was closed out and completed, then procurement of, of a project of this size and scale would take much, much longer. Just uh, other witnesses have suggested that the volume of reviewable design data was much greater than they had seen on projects of this nature. Mm. But am I right in thinking you're saying that, that that's not your view? Um, uh, I'm not saying that it's not my view. What I'm saying is that there is uh, a lot of documentation. Um, there was a lot of documentation in this project. Um, again, if you take a, a, a CapEx project, sorry, a, a capital expenditure project, we don't have uh, an SPV and, a, and an FM uh, involvement. Um, the, the documentation will be less for obvious reasons. For, for a PFI or for an NPD project, there will be lots more documentation. There was a lot of documentation uh, on this project. And obviously reading the documents that, that you would have seen, there was a number of deliverables that some didn't get completed by financial close. And that, that's not because people weren't trying. Uh, I think there was just a general agreement between everyone that the suite of documents needs to be as, as complete as we can, given the time constraints and then in order to reach financial close so that we can then go on and build it. But just so I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying, in relation to the volume of reviewable design data for the project, was it more or less than would be normal for a project of this nature? Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to avoid, avoid the question. I, I suppose what I'm saying is a, a project of this scale, there, there is a lot of uh, reviewable design data. Uh, it didn't jump out at me. Uh, at the time, but I'm sure if you ask people that have to do this, deal with this day in, day out, that uh, there is a lot to do post financial close. That's probably why they're saying that, because at the end of the day, there, they'll be the ones that are having to deal with that post financial close. And just in terms of the, the items that were included as reviewable design data, the whole environmental matrix get, gets included. Did you have any concerns from a commercial perspective that the environmental matrix and the engineering requirements for the ventilation system hadn't been locked down before financial close? I, I didn't uh, have any concerns. You know, again, if I, if I look back now uh, and, the, and there were some issues, then clearly we, we would have dealt with them. If, if there was a financial implication, we would have raised that and brought that to the client's attention. The, the reason I, I say that is, that yeah. is, again, the inquiry is going to hear from Mr. McKechnie of, of TUV Sued. Yeah. And in his witness statement, he says he'd never seen a, an environmental matrix being included as reviewable design data. And he describes it as being potentially commercially dangerous to do that right. because you wouldn't know exactly what ventilation system you, you had to install. Do you have any observations on that? I suppose you know his, his comment is, is a valid one. Uh, in terms of that there might be financial implications depending on what the the, the ventilation requirements are. Uh, if I think back to the submission that, that we would have put in, uh, there would have been an amount of money uh, for a ventilation system that uh, would have been relevant at the time to the submission that we put in. Now, as with, with contracting, um, you know, we, we take the design and build risk, uh, and unless a, a client makes makes a change, that's that's one of the risks that, that we would take as a as a contractor. Um, so you know, Stuart Stuart's raising that as a as probably some of the experiences that he's had. Um, again, I go back to if someone had, had raised a red flag to me saying there is a problem here. This is going to come back uh, unless we nail this, right? Unless we sort this out. Uh, and get get an agreement on what it is, then again, it's easy to look back ten years ten years on and go, "Yeah, we probably should have dealt with that, but that's <laughs> that's contracting, and that's uh in in you look at what's in front of you at the time. Thank you.
The next thing that I want to go on and ask you about is, is really some more questions about the relationships in the period, really from the, the summer of 2014 until <clears throat> financial close. You tell us a, a bit about this in, in your statement about some of the, the meetings that are, are taking place between IHSL and, and Multiplex in that period. And you mentioned a, a colleague of yours, Ross Bolling Ross, Ross Ballingall, yeah. yeah. Uh, who was he and what, what was his role in the project? So he, he was our managing director. Uh, and I'd worked with Ross uh, for a number of years. We did uh, Peterborough together. Uh, we uh, we actually lived up in, in Glasgow together for a couple of years when we were when we were delivering that. Um, but he had taken on the managing director role, uh, and I carried on with all the healthcare projects. Uh, and it was a time when um, it was probably getting there was a few frustrations on on all party sides that things weren't happening quick enough, and there was a, a potential that financial close might slip. Um, so uh, we had a, a system in place where some of the senior directors within each of the parties could get called uh, and have a steering group meeting. So um, while I was on holiday, uh, Ross attended a meeting, I think it was August. Uh, actually, I might have put it somewhere in there. We'll, we'll, we'll come on and look at yeah, the, okay, the, sorry, the yeah. minutes in a moment. So he, he effectively attended the meeting as a senior uh, director of the business with, uh, with Macquarie's as well. So we'll come on and look at that minute because today's not today's not a memory test. But right. you're on holiday, so you don't attend that meeting. Correct. And Mr. Bollingall's attending. Yeah. Just again, we'll look at the detail in a minute. But why is that meeting taking place, and, and what was to be discussed? Um, the meeting was taking place because there was frustration on on all parties: uh, Macquarie's, ourselves, Buig, uh the client, and their advisors. That uh, there was a potential. Um, that we weren't going to achieve financial close in the timescales that everyone was trying to drive towards. And so it was a sort of meeting of meeting of minds to try and clear some of the blockers, uh, some of the frustration, some of the, the white noise, as, as, as Ross called it, to, uh, to bring everyone together to say, look, you're all sort of, you know, in, in the weeds and all of this. We need to just take a breather, get everyone together, and, and put a marker down so that everyone is crystal clear where we need to get to. If I could ask you just to have in front of you, please, but bundle eight, page 11. Bundle eight, page 11. Which should be a, a minute of a special yep. project steering board meeting from the yep. 22nd of August 2014. Is, is this the, the meeting that takes That's place? It. You're on holiday Correct. and your colleague, Mr. Bollingall, yep. attends at that. That's the one. And if we look to, to section two, you see program. It says SG Susan Goldsmith noted that NHSL had significant concern about the project program, and that this meeting was an opportunity for IHSL to discuss progress with the steering board. Being a major project, the milestones were in the public domain, and NHSL need to have confidence in IHSL to deliver that. Do you see yeah. that? And again, is that what you're talking about in terms of concerns about getting correct close? Yeah. If if we look. Over the page, or a couple of pages on, to page 13, see that the second full paragraph beginning, RB stated that? Yeah. But RB stated that there was a genuine mismatch in NHSL's and IHSL's expectations, where IHSL were being asked to deliver much more than in other projects, and considerably more than was required for comfort of operational functionality. He felt that this demonstrated a paranoia and lack of trust in IHSL. Do you see that? Yep. And again, did, did that reflect your views and understanding at the time? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, that's exactly it. Um, then if we look on two, two paragraphs, you see that the final two lines up, there's a wording RB responded. We're on in page 13, two paragraphs on from the one we looked at. RB responded that NHSL needed to be pragmatic or this program would fail as well. It's in the... Yeah, you've got it, right. yeah. yeah. And it continues, at MB, who's Mike Baxter from Scottish Government, asked if there was a common understanding of the requirements to sign off on operational functionality. In BC, Brian Curry responded that he didn't think that this was the case. 
GW expressed his concern that the programme tabled was not achievable if IHSL were still looking to negotiate terms. ER noted that changes in design develop development would, would always happen. Like it, it seems from the minute of this meeting that there, there's perhaps a, people are talking at, at cross purposes mm. and, and seeking to do fundamentally di different things. Is, is that your understanding of the position between the parties as at summer 2014? Yeah, I, just to, obviously I wasn't at the meeting, so I, I can't sort of read the body language of, of, of what was going on there, but certainly the sentiments that's coming through from, from both sides. And, it, and if I go back to my one of my earlier paragraphs where I talk about the relationship and team building, and this, this unfortunately was, was sadly lacking in terms of having everyone working uh, a proper, true public-private relationship. Now, again, it's easy for me to sit here and say that, but, but having worked with a lot of teams, you know when teams are working well, you know when high-performing teams are working well because you, you just sense that everyone has got a common goal, everyone has, has got uh, sort of one project hat on. With here, the sentiment that's coming out in this meeting probably just draws draws out a lot of the frustrations that were probably going on with, amongst all of the, the, the parties. And I'm not saying everyone was, you know, we were lily white or um, there was probably, a, a, you know, I think Ross made the statement about a, a lack of trust and that's, that's um, you need to build trust and that's how you do that through working with teams together. And, and it, it's coming out loud and clear in, in these meeting minutes that we needed to sort of take a pause, take a breather and just try and reconnect everyone to take this across to financial close. Now, you, you talk about getting it to financial close, but those fundamental mismatches and expectations, did they ever actually get resolved before financial close or, or was the resolution simply to take all the difficult issues and make them reviewable design data? I, I can't recall all of the issues getting resolved. I'm, I'm sure some would have been resolved. Uh, I know there was a lot of work done to try and sort of repair that relationship. Um, going in, you know, post-financial close, you then just get on with the job and you have to work together. And it, it's a different, I'm trying to explain it, there's a different feeling between, between you, you get to financial close and then you've got to go on and deliver. And, and it's almost like a change of, uh, of mindset. Um, it shouldn't be, but there is, in, in my view. Whereas if you've got a team that's worked together really closely during the preferred bidder stage, that should be seamless going into the construction delivery and the, the ongoing operational side of it. Um, but again, going back to that fatigue word, I think everyone just, we needed to get it closed to allow the job to happen. I guess one issue I'd be interested in your views on, though, is if there's problems at this point in the summer, there's then a, a large volume of unresolved issues that simply become reviewable design data. If the relationships weren't working and that's put in as reviewable design data, mm. on one view, is that not just storing up problems for further down the line once there's a contract in place? It, it, it could be, um, but it also could be um, an opportunity for everyone to just draw a line in the sand, reach financial close, and then the delivery of that project will get resolved one way or another because that's, that's, how, construct, that's how teams work together. You, you, you reach financial close, draw a line on the sand, you've then got to get to, to completion and you work together to, to deliver that uh, with, the, with the set of cards that you're dealt with. Thank you. The, the next document I'd ask you to, to look at is in bundle 8, please, at, at page 15. So bundle 8, page 15. And this is a steering board commercial subgroup meeting that takes place on the 31st of October 2014. You're not noted as an attendee, but if you look at the, the third last entry for the attendees, John Ballantyne yep. d does attend. Yep. Um, although you're not at the meeting, do you remember discussing what happened at this meeting with, with Mr Ballantyne? I don't specifically recall what was discussed at that meeting, no. We'll look through the, the, the minute, and, and again, if, if you simply didn't have a discussion with them, don't remember, please do just say, don't feel yeah. it, like you've got to speculate. But the, the reason that I raise it with you is, if we could look on to page 16 of the minute, please. The third full paragraph beginning GW stated, do you see that? Yep. 
The GW stated that he was disappointed by the lack of progress since the previous meeting and reassurances from IHSL and losing confidence in their ability to propose an honest and realistic programme and del deliver it. Have you seen that? Yep. Again, I'd just be interested in your observations that we've looked at the meeting from, from the summer, lack of trust, paranoia. doesn't seem by October that relations have improved. Was, was that your understanding that, that relations hadn't improved by this point? I think, you know, my, my understanding is that, that you've still got to work together. So irrespective of, of what people's views are, people say uh, statements, people make uh, statements in meetings, losing confidence, um, lack of trust. When, when you when you take yourself back into what collectively we're trying to do, um, I guess my, my view is that at the end of the day, we're, we're all sort of here to do a job and people can have their comments, and make their statements, and it's very easy to make those statements. But fundamentally, it's about how you then, you know, we celebrate all the good things together, but it's how you deal with difficult issues and then move forward, deal with those issues going on. Again, this is one person's view of saying they're losing confidence. If I asked all, all of our team, um, they probably might say the same thing or they've, they've patched up some relationships with some of the individuals that they're working with um, because they know they've then got to work with them beyond financial close. So it, it's probably easy for people to make those statements. Um, the fact that we go from August where we had the steering group meeting uh, and, and Ross is called into a meeting uh, along with other senior directors from Macquarie's. Um, I think what that does say to, to everyone here is that at the time, it was difficult. Um, but you know, nothing is easy. And collectively, you try and work your way through. So relationships weren't... I won't, I won't say relationships were terrible. I, you know, I've seen a lot worse. But um, the, the, the meeting of minds and the, the getting to financial close, the pressures that I'm sure everyone had, not just to get to financial close, but outside of, of that were probably immense on, on all the stakeholders. Um, and it's, as again, it's easy to, to make those sort of comments and, and, and put those into meeting minutes. It's how you deal with those uh, coming out. And, you know, we fast forward to now. We're looking, looking back retrospectively, but the hospital's built. There are people being treated in the hospital. Um, and hopefully people are, are, are pleased with the facility. I guess what I'd be interested in is, October 2014 seems relations are still extremely tense, very strained. February 2014 contract signed, financial close. What, if anything, changes between the October and the February to get to a point that the parties sign the contract? There, there, there comes a point where everyone has to realise that we've got to agree at a point in time to move on, otherwise we'll never get the job built. So, you know, when we get to, to financial close, it was probably a relief on all parts. In, in February, uh, in the February time. Um, but also, it's again, it's a t an opportunity to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, we've been through that. Now we, we now need to go on and deliver, both from a design and build point of view and then from an operational point of view, IHSL and, and Buig need to manage it, uh, operate it after. Again, what would be interesting is it, it, it seems that in the October there's a fundamental disagreement on, on what's required. Does any of that get resolved by financial close or are those difficult issues simply put in as reviewable design data? Again, some of that probably would have been put into reviewable design data uh, because it wouldn't have all been closed out uh, within that, that period of time. Um, but again, I go back to there comes a point where everyone needs to cut through and agree a position. Otherwise, these jobs will never get built. So that, that was the meeting of minds to say, there's stuff that we can agree now. There's probably going to be design development that needs to take place post financial close, and there was probably a, well, not the probably there was an agreement uh, as the as the contract would have set out what was agreed and what wasn't agreed to be reviewed post FC. And again, if we just think about financial close, what would some of the implications be both for NHSL Lothian and also for IHSL and Multiplex if? if financial close hadn't been reached in, in February 2015? Uh, a, a number of things. It, it would have meant that uh, our, our team that we had 
from if I take the multiplex team, we had a, a lot of people working on the on the job, um, and it's a point where you built up the team. We were sharing an office with with the client up at, at Kane and Lane, um, and you've got people who are um, have, have been put in a place to actually deliver the project. Equally, you've got designers, you've got engineers, you've got the supply chain. Everyone is lined up and ready to deliver the project. Uh, and equally, on the client side, you've got uh, time pressures on the fact that they'll be moving from, from other hospitals into the new facility. Um, and you've also got uh, uh, financial implications for if this thing just drifts on uh, with, with no, seeing, no, no end uh, occurring. So... For everyone, it was in everyone's interest to reach a point of financial close, and which was which was February. Um, and again, as I say, to draw that line in the sand to allow the job to then take place. And if we just think of um, multiplex, could they have held the contract price for the design and build indefinitely? <laughs> um, yeah, you can't hold anything indefinitely. If it, it, it depends how long the thing goes on for. Uh, we were we were trying desperately to 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 make sure that we delivered on what we said we were going to deliver, um, and that that's very difficult when you've got um, you know people stating that they're losing confidence and lacks of trust on on either side. Uh, what I would say is that you know we we stand by when I worked at the time, we'd always stand by what what we committed to. Uh, and deliver uh, what we've been asked to do. Irrespective of, of, of financial close, you then have that uh, reviewable design data that you work through with the team. And, you know, with the best will in the world, hopefully it comes out right on the right side of, of where we all thought that was going to be. Thank you. There's one final topic that, that I'd raise with you, and it's really an issue that I raise for any assistance that you can provide the inquiry with. NHS cell Lothian's position before the inquiry is that effectively there was an error in a spreadsheet in the environmental matrix that never gets spotted before the period that you get the financial close. Now that's controversial, different people will disagree with that. But if you have a project of, of this nature whereby there's potentially a spreadsheet error that doesn't get spotted, do you think there are, are any issues with the procurement process, the type of contract that resulted in that issue? And if there was, is, is there any ways that, that matters could be done better in the future to try to avoid that type of issue cropping up in future projects? T taking the, the first limb of that, um, th there are always undoubtedly going to be discrepancies in documents. Uh, with, there are the, 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 more, the more mature a procurement model comes, the more documents then start to get fed into uh, a, a, um, a procurement model. If you go back to when EFI originally started, it was, it was quite a, uh, in its infancy, and there probably wasn't sufficient documents at the time. As that market got more mature and, and more people got involved, the, the, the suite of documents got larger and larger. If you take this project, um, and if, if there was an error and it wasn't picked up, um, then it, it's unfortunate, um, given how many people get involved in, in a project of this size and, and scale and, and not one of us picked it up. Uh, it's, it is disappointing. But at the end of the day, everyone is human. The errors are made. Um, it's how you come out the other side. So taking the second limb of your question, what would I do differently? I think... Um, First and foremost, if you, if you start with a suite of documents uh, and have them up uh, as you're getting closer and closer to financial close, but, but have gateways before you even get to financial close and have the key documents up on a screen with everyone in a room so that we're all looking at one document and you're not relying on emails or documents being sent via Aconex or going to different. You have a core team of people and the key documents, you sit with them on a screen so that everyone's looking at the same document. And going back to my earlier statement, if you then rewrite a document that says, this is what we want, has everyone agreed on that? Yes. This is how much you're paying for it? Yes. Those two then should align. 
because collectively you sat in the room and agreed what's up on the screen and it's it's grey we want for those rooms, it's not black or grey. It's that collective working relationship um, that everyone agrees and, and buys into and, and that's again making sure that the, the, the right people are in the room, the right resources are committed um, and that you have the, the, the time and the, and the desire from everyone to achieve that common goal. Thank you. Mr. Serkis, I don't have any further questions at this stage, but Lord Brudy may have questions, or equally there, there may be questions from core participants. Okay. Lord Brudy, I, I noticed that it's just turned half past 11. Your Lordship may want to take the, the coffee break at the moment. Any core participants could raise issues with me, and then possibly after the coffee break when we come back, we could deal with any issues and then move straight into Mr. Ballantyne's evidence. Um, that's what we'll do. Uh, Mr. Serkis, um, as Ms. McGregor said, uh, these are all his questions to you for the moment. Um, however, I want to give the legal representatives in the room the opportunity to consider whether they may propose further questions, Ms. McGregor, and in certain circumstances they may uh, wish to uh, um, ask questions directly, and I may permit that. Um, now, coffee is available, and I certainly hope you will get, uh, get a cup of coffee. Um, what I intend to do is maybe allow 20 minutes rather than anything less. In that 20 minutes, everyone gets coffee, and everyone um, has the opportunity of um, speaking to Mr. McGregor. Depending on the outcome of that, maybe I have decisions to make, but in any event, we will ask you to come back, um, even if it is not, to answer questions. So uh, I think the key point is coffee. Perfect. Right. Sit again about ten or five to twelve.
Mr McGregor. Uh, Lord Brewer, there's one point of detail that I propose to pick up with Mr Circus, and then I, I don't think there will be any applications from core participants, and then we could move on to Mr Ballantyne. So just so I've got, there's one matter you're going to clarify. Do you anticipate any applications? I, I don't, my Lord. Right. If Mr Circus could be brought back in. I think, Mr. Circus, just one one matter. Although I'll I'll do a final check, okay. Mr. McGregor. Mr. Circus, there's just one point of detail that I wish to pick up with you, and it's really we've we've talked at various points about IHSL as the special purpose company, special purpose vehicle. Am I right in thinking that IHSL, the special purpose vehicle, gets incorporated at financial close? Is that correct? Benefit right. capital. Yeah. Okay, so when we're talking about IHSL in the period pre-financial close, as a technical matter, we're really talking about a consortium of Multiplex, Macquarie and, and Buigs coming together? Correct, yeah. Thank you. I, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Right. Um, has Ms McGregor correctly anticipated that nothing further arises? Right. Take that as confirmation. Mr Circus, that is the... End of your evidence, and thank you for that evidence. And I'm saying, in saying thank you, I don't mean just turning up this morning. Because uh, I appreciate there's a lot of preparation in um, that goes into uh, preparing a witness statement. You will have done that work. So thank you um, for everything you've done in relation to the inquiry. But you're now free to go. And, thank you. Um, taken out. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think we're now in a position to. Um, yes, my The next witness is Mr. Mr. Ballantyne. Gordon Ballantyne.
Good afternoon, Good afternoon uh, Mr. Valentine. And to you. Um, Sorry. Here we go. Your lunch up, sir. Now, as you appreciate, you're about to be asked questions by Mr. McGregor, who's sitting opposite you at this council to the inquiry. Um, before then, will you take the oath? I will indeed, yes. Sitting where you are, okay. uh, if you would raise your right hand and repeat these words after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That I will tell the truth. That I will tell the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the Thank truth. Thank you, Mr. Ballantyne. Mr. McGregor. You are Mr. John Ballantyne, is that correct? I am indeed. And you've provided a witness statement to the inquiry? Yes. And a copy should be provided or available to you. Equally, any documents I want to take you to should come up on the screen in, in front of you. So, if you do want at any point to refer to your statement, please just do let me know. Thank you very much. For anyone following in the electronic bundles, Mr. Ballantyne's statement is in bundle 13, pages 222 to 235. The content of the statement is going to constitute part of your evidence to inquiry, and I'm also going to ask you some questions today. If I could begin by asking you some questions about your career, which you set out from paragraph two onwards of your statement. You tell the inquiry that you joined John Lang Construction in 1979, is that correct? That's correct, yes. And you trained at that point as a, as a quantity surveyor? Yes. And you worked for approximately 42 years in the construction industry? Yes, and continue to work related to the industry, unfortunately, yes. And during your career, you worked for Brookfield Multiplex from 2011 and until June 2021. That's correct. We'll, we'll come on to, to talk about that in a, in a bit more detail in, in a moment, but, but you tell us that you're currently a consultant. What consultancy work are you currently doing? I work for a number of different construction companies providing advice in terms of operational aspects, some of the challenges that are facing construction companies these days, just in an advisory capacity more than anything else. Okay. So Whenever you worked for Multiplex, what was your role with them? Uh, I started on the Glasgow Hospital. That was the first time that I met Mr. Serkis and Ross Ballingall and the Multiplex team. I was employed as commercial director for that particular development. I then progressed on to be bid leader for the Royal Hospital for Sick Children Opportunity and thereafter moved down to London, where I took on the role as um, a main board director, eventually on the board of Multiplex Europe, responsible for a number of projects, mainly based in London. So you, whenever you come to start working with Multiplex, you're a commercial director. That's correct. What does that role involve? In terms of legal and financial aspects related to the delivery of the Hospital for Greater Glasgow and Clyde through in Glasgow. And again, so I'm understanding things more in the commercial side as more opposed in the to commercial with side, Mr. technical Higer, aspects than, of construction. Than operational, yes, if you were to draw a distinction between those two elements. Okay, thank you. And that's the work that you were doing in the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow. That's correct. You then mentioned that you became a, a bid leader. What's a bid leader and how does that differ from the role you, you undertook as a commercial director? What very closely with... Paul Circus in splitting the responsibility of taking the IHSL project team through competitive dialogue and subsequent to that preferred bidder financial close and thereafter I took on the role as project director for the delivery for a short period of Royal Hospital for Sick Children and Department of Clinical Neurosciences. So as, as the bid leader, um, I, I would be at the competitive dialogue sessions effectively leading the team um, orchestrating who would make presentations on whatever the given subject of the day was, and then back of scene, off books, making sure that all of the issues that had to be presented at the dialogue sessions were actually being actioned by our IHSL team members. So whenever you, you tell us that you led the bid, did that involve formulating the tender that was going to go in? Was that part of, of your role? Effectively making sure that the I's were dotted and T's were crossed and all of the actionable points were exactly that, actioned on behalf of IHSL. But, but I represented primarily the multiplex team within that consortium. We'll come on and talk about the consortium, but just, just so I'm understanding practically what you do, yeah. you've got responsibility for the tender that goes in, but presumably because you're on the commercial side, you're having other technical people that, that feed in to assist you. 
Indeed, yes. If that's at, at, at the bid stage, competitive dialogue, what, what would you be doing at that stage? Again, competitive dialogue, there were a number of presentations as to our offering that had to be pulled together and tabled to the board and their advisory team. So as part of that, I was to make sure that we got to the point where we were making the best effort as the competitive dialogue participant. So I lay, liaised with all of the team members, Puig, as well as Macquarie, and also the Multiplex team and their advisors, including the designers. Okay. Again, competitive dialogue, management role, but making yes. sure that everything on the technical side that needs to be done is being done and is pushed down to the appropriate people. That's it. So what then is your role from the point of, of preferred bidder to financial close? Not that dissimilar, except you're not in competition any longer. So there were a number of milestones that had to be achieved in order to get to financial close. And as part of that, a list of deliverables that had to be achieved. So again, my primary role was to the best of my ability, make sure that IHSL as a consortium ticked all of the deliverable boxes. Okay. No. But orchestrating more than actually producing. Thank you. If I could just ask you about exactly who, who's doing what, really from the point that IHSL comes together as a consortium in the period up to, to preferred bidder. Mm -hmm. okay? And if we take things in, in stages, the inquiries heard evidence that Integrated Health Solutions Limited, so the limited company IHSL, actually comes into being at financial close, is, is that correct? That, that would be my understanding, yes. There's no purpose to it other than to deliver post-financial close when it's all sealed, if you like. So when, when we're talking about IHSL before financial close, we're, we're talking about a consortium coming together, but the company itself hasn't actually been formed. Is That's that correct? correct, yes. So can you just talk, talk me through who's in the consortium that's going to put the bid in? So Multiplex as the design and build contractor, Macquarie's effectively pulling together the financial package that supported the NPD offering, and Buig in the hard FM management side of the operational part of the facility when it came online. One of the, the areas that the inquiry is interested in is, is the environmental matrix that was used for the, the project. And by the project, I mean the project for the Royal Hospital for Children and Young People and the, the Department for, for Clinical Neurosciences. The concept of an environmental matrix, was that something you were familiar with coming into your involvement in the project? It was a document that emerged as part of the suite of board or NHSL's expectations of outcome. Yes, so I recognise its need and what it was for. You mentioned within your statement that an environmental matrix had also been used on the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. Is, is that correct? Yes. And can I just check, in, in terms of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow, who had produced the environmental matrix? And by that, I mean, was it the procuring authority or was it tenderers that had to complete that document? Not dissimilar to Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Edinburgh, the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Board had done a lot of work in advance of engaging with a potential supply chain. So that document was produced by their advisory team in consultation with their clinical staff and formed part of the brief of expectations. So when you got the tender documentation, invitation to participate in dialogue, and then subsequently the invitation to submit final tenders. Were you surprised to see an environmental matrix there? No. It's not a matter of dispute that there weren't room data sheets produced by NHS Lothian and included as, as part of the procurement documents, the invitation to participate in dialogue. Were you surprised that there wasn't a full suite of room data sheets produced? No, because as the design matures, so the ability to produce a more definitive room data sheet would become available. If the design is not mature, then the room data sheet can't be completed to the extent that all parties would want them to be, would be my understanding, <laughs> as to why it wasn't produced in the fullest extent at that time. Mm. 
Again, I'm interested in, in your view, really, from yes, the, the commercial side as opposed to what an engineer would say. But the, mm -hmm. the inquiry has heard other witnesses that work in the construction industry have said that their understanding is that room data sheets would be the, the standard briefing tool that a procuring authority would provide when they went out to conduct a, a tender exercise. Is that your position, having worked in the industry for 40 no, years? No, I would say every project is unique to itself and varying levels of expectation, documentation, if you could join those words together. Um, no, it, it can be dissimilar from a very broad brief of expectation by a client body to a very definitive and prescriptive brief, effectively the full spectrum. In terms of, of your in, involvement in, in the project, I appreciate that it, it's over 10 years ago before you started the, the procurement exercise, but, but were you involved from start to finish? Did you go to the, the bidder's day, for example? Yes, so um, mul Multiplex bit of history. Um, Peterborough Hospital was the first project in the UK that Multiplex had delivered. Uh, delivered healthcare projects internationally, and it was a sector of construction delivery that Multiplex would want to continue to participate in and would, in the UK in particular, would want to continue to participate in and therefore monitoring the what hospitals are likely to be constructed where in the UK was something that was on the agenda of Multiplex and that's why when this opportunity came up, particularly since we were in the throes of constructing the one for Greater Glasgow and Clyde, it was very much at the front of our desire to win and convert agenda. So you're really involved right from the start. Right from the start. Bidder's Day, right through to the, the end of the project. And again, it's, it's a long time ago, but can you tell us your recollection of, of what were tenderers being told about the status of the reference design and the status of the environmental matrix in particular? My understanding was the expectations of the board were very specific, as much as they ever could be, and that having taken the time to develop those expectations, they were not to be compromised. When you say you didn't think they were to be compromised, what, what was your understanding of the, the status of the environmental matrix? I would have said the state of the art hospital expectation or aspiration of the board gave our team more architectural license than it did engineering license. And similarly, on the engineering license, departmental clinical adjacencies were not to be interfered with the number of rooms of a particular type and the size of those rooms, similarly not, not to be messed around with. Do you recall any specific discussions about the environmental matrix as opposed to, as you said, adjacencies and, and other issues? No, I, I don't. I, I can't. I was surprised during this process to understand the elevated importance of the environmental matrix. Because it was not a document that jumped off the page as being one of great debate and gnashing of teeth and wailing. Just this is what we want and that's the definition of it, was what that document was there to provide. If I could ask you to have in front of you, please, bundle two, page 750. Bundle two, page 750. This is some notes from the, the Bidder's Day that took place on, on the 13th of December 2012. So you, you probably won't have seen these before, but there were the, the notes that have been provided by, by one of the, the speakers at, at that event. And it's really just to ask for your, your observations on, on a few comments. If, if we could look to page 759, please. You see there's a reference at the top to, to slide 39 reference design? I do, yes. And it says, to clarify what we really mean by a reference design, what were the attractions given the departure from previous PPP stroke PFI projects where an exemplar design was the norm? And then there's a series of bullet points. Assists with the OBC and accuracy of pre-procurement costing provides greater certainty over the final design solution mm -hmm. and assists significantly in defining a quality threshold. Do you see that? 
I do. Is that the, the type of information that was being conveyed to the prospective tenders at the, at the bidder's day? Yes. And if we, we look down, you'll see approximately two-thirds of the way down the page, there's a heading mandatory requirements. Do you see that? I do. It comprises the information that defines operational functionality and is indicated in interdepartmental layouts, department layouts, and, and room layouts. Do you see that? I do, yes. Again, I appreciate it's a, it's a long time ago, but was that all that you were being told was really the, the mandatory requirements? And the reason I say that is we, we don't see the environmental matrix being, being included there. No, because I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's more the architectural expectations of the board that those mandatory requirements are talking to spatial both size and interdependency and relationships of departments. So not necessarily the heating and cooling of those particular departments. And if we could then look on the page 760, towards the bottom of the page, there's a heading room data sheets. You see that? See that, yes. Room data sheets. And the notes say, standard format room data sheets have not been prepared by the board for the project. Instead, specific room requirements are detailed in a combination of the following documents. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And it says, general requirements, clinical output spec, environmental matrix, schedule of operational design notes, equipment schedule, schedule of accommodation, and operational functionality elements of the reference design. Do you see that? I do. So, again, just so I'm understanding things, am I correct in thinking that, that what bidders are being told is that whenever they need to find information for the production of the room data sheets, they should look at the items that are set out in, in the bullet points, and that would include the environmental matrix. Yes, effectively, the board's expectations that would then be developed by the three bidding entities, yes. And it might be an obvious question, but in terms of the tender that was going to be submitted, where was IHSL going to get the values for the room data sheets if we're talking about the, the ventilation requirements? <coughs> I would have suggested the environmental matrix would have been your reference document, your source of that expectation data. If I could ask you to, to look on page 762, please. You see a section at the top, note. Page yes. 762. Note, the board's construction requirements will always take precedence over the reference design for matters which do not define operational functionality. You see that? I do. Do, do you remember any discussions about that at, at the bidder's day? Not specifically about that point, no. If, if we just look at, at the note there then, what, what would you understand that statement to mean? The board's construction requirements will always take precedence over the reference design for matters which do not define operational functionality. I would suggest that the reference design um, is a layout of expectation. The BCRs go into far more detail as to what that layout will then contain and perform as. So the board's construction requirements are in far more developed detail by the board to again set their expectations. But overall, operational functionality is something that the successful bidder and delivery entity would have to satisfy. Thank you. It's a recognised medical term in D&B operations. It has to function as a hospital and do various things in order to tick that criteria box. Thank you. If we could look on to page 763, please. Just approximately in the middle of the page is a paragraph beginning following the close of competitive dialogue. See that? Yes. Following the close of competitive dialogue and the appointment of the preferred bidder, the reference design will be replaced with the preferred bidder's affordable and commercially acceptable design solution. Do you see that? I do. Was that what bidders were being told from the very 
outset. Is that your recollection? Yes, because that, that's a term that you would see in um, a procurement process, especially one that's subject to um, potential challenge by the unsuccessful bidders. So that, that, that terminology is quite often used as part of a procurement briefing document. So again, so I'm understanding things, tenderers are told, there's the, there's the reference design stage, but at some point that reference design is going to be replaced with the preferred bidder's solution. The preferred bidder's solution incorporating a number of other documents, which may indeed be extracts of the reference design. They may live on in that proposal from the preferred bidder. I think you have to look at it holistically as opposed to trying to dissect it word for word, but that's my view. And in terms of the environmental matrix itself, was your understanding that it was a completely fixed specification, or was that something that tenderers and particularly the preferred bidder would, would have to develop? My view was if we were going to move away from it in any way whatsoever, we would have to get absolute express approval to do it. It was the line in the sand and definition of what that line was and where it was. If I could ask you to have in front of you, please, bundle 10, volume 2, bundle 10, volume 2, at page 1300. See, there's a, a second email there. It's from, from a, a Ken Hall to Maureen Brown and, and Graham Greer. Yep, recognise Ken. He led our m and &E, team m and &E engineer for Multiplex, yes. So was he someone that you worked on whenever you were leading the bid? Yes. A and what was Mr Hall's role? So he worked with um, our designer, Tav Sud, as well as our... Uh, selected subcontractor Mercury Engineering in putting together the MEP element of our bid. And what mechanical do you mean by electrical. MEP? Mechanical, electrical and plumbing, sorry. Thank you. If we look at that email from Mr Hall, it says, Good morning, Mo Stroke Graham. Stuart has asked if he could have the environmental matrix in Excel rather than PDF version allow to populate the schedules with any changes mm -hmm. is that something you could help us with do you see that yeah I do yes and i think the question that i'd ask you is if the environmental matrix is a, a line in the sand it's a fixed client brief why would mr mckechnie need an excel spreadsheet to, to make changes to it i really can't answer that in terms of any changes except to see if there were any Agreed changes, and by agreed I mean with NHSL as the board, then that document would be more flexible and manipulatable in terms of incorporating those changes and getting it out to the supply chain that Mercury Engineering would be expecting to deliver to elements of the environmental matrix. Air handling unit performance being an example. Thank you. If I could ask you to have in front of you, please, bundle four, page 218. Bundle four, page 218, a document headed Environmental Matrix Comments, 13th of October 2014. Do you see that? Yes. Have you seen this document before? Can't say yes or no. I possibly have. I can't confirm that. I need to go back and... So in terms of the 13th of October 2014, you've mm -hmm. been the preferred bidder at this point. Yeah. And it's a document that one column says the board has the following initial technical comments on the draft one of the environmental matrix. Mm -hmm. And then you see in the right-hand column, IHSL update, 22nd of October 2014. I do, yeah. So it seems to be a document whereby the board is, is commenting on proposals and then IHSL is, is responding. Is that a document that it would be likely that Mr Hall would be dealing with? Yes, he, he would be an owner and participant to making sure that said the right things, particularly in the right-hand column. Yeah. 
and I think again, it's, it's just really looking for your observations. You've described the environmental matrix as as a line in the sand, mm -hmm. and I think one thing the inquiry would be interested to know your your views on is if it's a line in the sand and it's effectively a fixed client brief. Why would NHSL Lothian be providing comments on the environmental matrix? It's a timing issue, I would suggest, as the design matures, spatially as well as in detail, the board may see fit to allow changes to that line in the sand and for that line to move. But at all times they would participate and sign off to any such changes, which is what this document is looking to control, would be my observation. Are you aware of, of whether or not the environmental matrix came to be in, included as reviewable design data within the, the final contract? I couldn't confirm that sitting here, Mr McGregor, no. Again, it's not, it's not a memory test, so if I could ask I you know, to have, have in front of you bundle five, yeah. please, and if, if we begin at, at page 869... So bundle, bundle 5 is the contract, and then on page 869, you should see a bold heading, Part 4, Non-Approved Project Co. Proposals, Design Data Comments. Do you see, see that? that? Yes, sir. So, again, just from your perspective as someone on the commercial side, were you aware at the point the contract signed that there is certain items that are reviewable design data? Yes. I, and again, just if you could explain your understanding of what was reviewable design data, why would there be a concept of reviewable design data in the contract? The board was to understand that our design offering met with their expectations. What's the conduit that allows that to happen? Reviewable design data. We present a design and they effectively, with their clinical as well as technical team, review that design offering. If we, if we could look on to page 880, please. This is still within the, the schedule of reviewable design data. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll see an entry there that, that's called an environmental matrix. Yep. So it, at least part of the environmental matrix is, is being included as, as reviewable design data. And I think that the question that I would pose is if, if the environmental matrix is client brief and it's a line in the sand, why do we see aspects of it popping up within a, a schedule of reviewable design data? Because effectively the reviewable design data needs to be incorporated into the contract in its finished form. An environmental matrix from an M&E point of view needs to be incorporated in its finished form. Effectively the design could have some fundamental requested changes incorporated within it that impact on the environmental matrix and they have to update them if the board wanted another operating theatre, then the environmental matrix would have more operating theatres after that change was instructed than it had before. So yes, it can mature alongside the rest of the design through the RDD process. But again, just so I'm understanding you, would that only be if there were perhaps new rooms put in or, or there was something new that was being added? It yes, I, I, I would say exactly what you just have a required change that then necessitates the environmental matrix being updated to incorporate that change. If I could ask you to have in, in front of you, please, bundle 13, page 224, which is your statement, and if we could look to, to paragraph 9, please. Okay. But paragraph 9, you say, one of the main aims of the board for the RHSC project, by board I mean NHSL, in my understanding, was to have absolute clarity on what they were going to receive as part of the procurement and delivery process. Do you see that? I do. Why do you say that? There had been projects in the past where, as I understood it and was advised, the board had expected and did not get their expectations met through a lack of clarity from the delivery vehicle. So to avoid that same situation developing again, there was a high level of diligence on the expectations being delivered 
as they had been briefed by the board. And you continue at paragraph nine, if we pick matters up in line three, Brian Curry and I had many a lengthy conversation mm -hmm. during the preferred bidder phase when the phrase environmental matrix kept reappearing. There were examples in the past where the NHS yes, yeah. Lothian board felt they did not get what they thought they were going to get and then could do nothing about it. That was something they desperately wanted to avoid in the RHSC project. This meant they went into the granular detail and absolute clarity was what they were driving to, not to get caught short by way of any misunderstanding of expectations and output result. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. So again, if we can just take the, the stages of, of the project. We've, we've looked at the preferred bidder day. What were you being told during competitive dialogue in relation to the environmental matrix? It was just another document of the board's definition by way of this is the reference design, here are the rooms, here are the spatial orientation of those rooms and their content, and here is the m &E output specification expectation, read environmental matrix. So all, all to be read in conjunction with one another. If, if we look on within your statement to, to page 225 of the bundle and, and paragraph 13, you see a paragraph beginning, yeah. we were told. So you state, we were told at the competitive dialogue meetings that the environmental matrix was mandatory and that there was to be no deviation. It, it was absolute. Just to be clear, who, who, who was telling you that? Oh, NHSL. I don't want to name any individuals necessarily, but the discussions that I was having with my team and the board's team, it was deliver on the expectations we are placing in front of you. I but there was a level of architectural license. There was a, a, an aim of the board uh, to deinstitutionalize the facility, and that's where our architectural team was allowed far more license than m and &E, I would suggest. I appreciate it's a long time ago and, and you're telling us your recollection is that's what you were being told at Competitive yes. Dialogue. Can you remember which individual from NHS Lothian was, was telling you that at the Competitive Dialogue meetings? I would have to say I, I couldn't single out a particular individual. No. The reason I, I raise that issue is it, yeah. it seems to be controversial whether that was or, or was not said. So, for example... Um, Mr. Greer of, of Mott MacDonald, who's still due to give evidence, mm -hmm. he doesn't recollect that type of discussion taking place. In fact, his position, as I understand it, is that IHSL was regularly reminded that they had responsibility for ensuring that the environmental matrix complied with published guidance, such as Scottish Health Technical Memorandum 0301. Am I correct in thinking that's not your recollection of what was happening at competitive dialogue? No. Did you have any discussions with, with anyone on, on the technical side? I appreciate you're on the commercial side. Did anyone on the technical side come back to you and say, well, actually, what, what we're being told is this is a document whereby we take responsibility for it and we need to check that it complies with, with published guidance. Do you recollect any conversations taking place with your team? I don't. That? No, it, it was not the subject of that type of debate where if it had been... It would definitely have been, yes, I would have had a recollection of it if that level of discussion had taken place, yeah. I would have to say that there would be commercial implications of not having two documents of that level of importance, an SHTM and an environmental matrix aligned into the world of derogations at that point. And in terms of, of your statement, there, there's various points whereby you outline your understanding of what the procurement documents required and, and your understanding of, of what the contractual position was. Should the inquiry understand that, that you are setting out your own views to try and be helpful? But yes, they, 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 these are my words and maybe erroneous because they're my thoughts and my words, you're correct, yes. I, I think the formulation that I've put to a number of witnesses is there's perhaps a recognition that those might be controversial and that you're not offering any expert view on what those terms definitively mean. Is that your position as well? It is. Thank you. If I could move on now and, and ask about IHSL's tender itself, I, I want to take you through some of the, the provisions with, within the tender. Now, mm -hmm. 
I appreciate that you've told us that you had overall responsibility and it might be other people that had fed into that. So as we go through matters, if it's something that you don't remember or you think it's completely out with the sphere that you were dealing with, please say that. I don't want you to speculate. Right. Yes. But equally, if we get to things that you remember why they were included, I'd be interested to know the thinking behind why those provisions were included within the tender. Okay. Surely. So if we proceed on that basis, if we can begin within bundle six, please. And if we can start at page three. So am I right in thinking that th this is this is the, the tender bid for the, the reprovision of the RHSC and DCN at Little France? Is this the we'll just wait for that to come up. So it should be bundle six, page three. I think we might be just having some technical difficulty. Certainly, my bundle six, page three, is a is a coloured page, which is the, the first page of, of the tender submission. Did you see in the? In I the recognise book? the cover page. Yep. Oh. If we see in the bottom left hand corner, it's it's a document dated the 13th of January 2014. I do, yes. So you say you recognise this, just again, we'll look at the detail, but what is this we're looking at? So again, the, the, this this was all of our documents looked not dissimilar to this one in terms of the cover page. So yes, I, I, many of our documents started off life with this as the cover sheet, if you like, but obviously in the box would be different text to describe subsequent pages. Thank you. And if we look on to, to page eight, you see a subheading 5.0 applicable standards. So bundle six, page eight. You see the, head, the bold heading applicable standards? I do. And the tender states all elements of the works shall be in accordance with the requirements of current legislation regulations and industry standards unless otherwise stated. The ventilation system shall accord with all appropriate hospital technical memoranda, codes of practice and relevant British and European standards and Appendix A. Do you see that? I do. Do you remember the basis for including that statement within the tender? No. The reason I, I raise this, and again you might not be able to, to help, is on one view, that reads as saying our bid, our solution is going to comply with all published guidance, hospital technical memoranda. And there's an issue as to whether the environmental matrix, which ultimately formed part of, of the contract, did, did fully comply with that. Are you Agreed. able to offer any assistance as to why IHSL in, included that, that statement in the tender? I think the important phrase there, and I don't want to speculate, is in the first sentence where it says, unless otherwise stated. So if a document did not accord with the second paragraph, then it otherwise stated. Thank you. Uh, so we will, except where we tell you we haven't, or a document says we haven't. Unless we've stated elsewhere, it yeah. will comply with the published guide. Mm -hmm. If we then look on to, to page 13, there should be a bold heading U10 ventilation systems, all air systems. If we could look down four paragraphs up from the bottom, there's a paragraph beginning, air volumes have been established. See that, yes. It says, air volumes have been established by consideration of heat gains or losses and also the air change rate necessary for comfort and safety as appropriate for the activity carried out in each area. Relative air pressures between rooms shall be maintained to suit the activity concerned by design of the supply and extract air volumes and use of pressure relief equipment where necessary to prevent cross-infection or transfer of unpleasant odours between areas as required by the ADB sheets. Heat recovery shall be provided between the supply and extract systems. Hospital ventilation systems will be in accordance with SHTM 
0301. Do you see that? I do. Again, just thinking back to that potential discrepancy mm -hmm. between whether the environmental matrix submitted by IHSL, including the contract, does or does not comply with, with SHTM 0301. Do you know the basis for IHSL to include that statement that the hospital ventilation systems shall be in accordance with SHTM 0301? I can't answer that specifically. Who would have responsibility for, for knowing that? Would it be Mr Hall or would it be someone else within the, the, the IHSL team? I think with, within our team, it would be the combination of Tulsud, Mercury Engineering and Multiplex's Mr Hall sitting atop that triangle. And again, if we could look on to, to page 35. See, 310 air handling units. It's the supply and extract air handling plan shall in all respects comply and align with the requirements and recommendation detailed within health technical memoranda, in particular SHTM 0301 and 0801, except where specifically noted within this specification. Do you see that? You do. And again, in, in terms of, of why those statements are being made about compliance and exceptions, would that have been other people that were feeding this information into you to, to complete the, the Yes. Gender? Again, from an engineering point of view, there may, may be some air handling variation from the SHTM, which again, as a guidance document, isn't necessarily 100% specific in output expectations, and therefore we would need to describe what we were offering. We're potentially at variance with SHTM. I'd ask you to, to look on to page 303, please. Beneath the various tables, you, you'll see a, a heading C8.2X. So it's, it's bundle six, page 303. Do you see the heading C8.2X, Environmental Conditions Room Matrix? I see it, yes indeed. And it states, the mechanical and electrical services shall be provided in accordance with the reference design environmental matrix, and we shall provide an addendum matrix for any rooms on an exception basis, highlighting any changes at preferred bidder stage. Do you see that? I do. Again, this might be an issue for Mr. Hall, but if the environmental matrix is the, is the line in the sand, why would it need to be updated? Because, again, necessary change may require the updating of it, and so that there's not any ambiguity on the final form of the environmental matrix. This is how it would be dealt with, potentially back to the request to have it provided in a Excel <coughs> format so that it could be updated to incorporate any change. If we then look on to, to page 304, please. You'd just above the tables, it would be bundle six, page 304. Bundle 6, page 304. See, just a, a above the, the table on the left-hand side, there's text beginning the room temperature set points. See it? Yes, indeed. I think it might be helpful if we could try and zoom in. It's quite small text. <laughs> so it says that the room temperature set points, air change rate, and ANDS 
shall be in accordance with SHTM03, SHTM03 and lighting information as SIBSI guide mm -hmm. LG2. Do you, do you see that? I do. Again, would that would that be something that was being fed back to you from from technical people such such as Mr. Hall? Yes. And do you know if there? Obviously, you describe the environmental matrix as as a line in the sand. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there was any exercise carried out by Mr. Hall or any subcontractors to to check whether the environmental matrix was was fully complying with published guidance, including SHTM 0301? No, because I understood that. Where it wasn't, the decision to make it not in accordance with had been taken before we became involved. If we then just look on to, to page 305, you see there's a bold heading, C8.3 Environmental Matrix, so bundle 6, page 305. Again, if we could maybe zoom zoom in on the on the box below C eight point three, beginning as indicated above, at the very bottom there. Do you see the text? Mm -hmm. As indicated above, no changes proposed at this time, nor envisaged in the future. But we will continue to review and advise back. The solutions are referenced on the heating, ventilation, and cooling strategy drawings, sequence five two one, five two four, and five two five, recorded in AP one point one. Section five point one mechanical drawing sure. schedule. I, I guess again, what I'd be interested to know is is that wording that we'll continue to review and, and advise back. If the environmental matrix is a line in the sand to be complied with, what, why would that process be required? I think it's more with reference to changes. If there were any changes proposed, not that IHSL would be making those proposals. But if the board required them to be changed, then they would need to be reviewed and the advice given as to what those changes would mean to the environmental matrix in its form current at the time of the suggested change. So I wouldn't be reading that to say there's an ongoing exercise behind the scenes continuing on the environmental matrix. Thank you. And then if we could look on to, to page 350, please. You see the, the bold heading 5.9.7 mechanical ventilation system? I do, yes, indeed. It states the ventilation systems to the hospital are designed in accordance with Scottish Health Technical Memoranda SHTM 0301. Ventilation shall be provided to suit both the operational and statutory requirements of the development. Although the development has been designed to maximise the use of natural ventilation, it's intended that rooms will not be reliant on yeah. natural ventilation alone unless they comply with maximum temperature limits listed in the RDS environmental matrix. To obviate problems with overheating due to 100 millimetre opening restrictions on opening windows, we have included for mechanical supply ventilation for ward areas and to provide mechanical cooling to all tempered air supply air handling units to provide the ability to supply air temperature a condition to ensure the internal temperatures in patient areas shall be maintained within comfort levels as illustrated within the separate ward bedroom comfort analysis report. Do you see that? I do. So again, it's really just, I think, to cover the same issue I'd covered before is the statement in the first paragraph, first sentence, that the ventilation systems to the hostel are designed in accordance with the Scottish Health Technical Memoranda SHTM 0301. Mm -hmm. If what you were doing was simply taking the environmental matrix, had IHSL actually done a check to make sure that what it was proposing did always comply with the requirements of, of SHTM 0301? No. In reading that sentence, you, you could understand or interpret that to mean definitively it complies with all aspects of. If the word generally had been inserted in front of designed, it might have read better from an IHSL point of view. And again, just 
So I'm, I'm understanding your position. I think you told us earlier that really we looked at the section that said unless stated otherwise. otherwise. Yes. So again, we, we don't see the unless stated otherwise, but we've seen that in, in earlier aspects of, of the tender documentation. Just, just to make sure I'm understanding you is, although we see old unqualified statements at, at certain points, there's qualified statements at, at, at other aspects. Is, is that really what you'd wanted to draw my attention to earlier? Yes. The, the, elsewhere in this document, there may be a specific pointer that says, but in this instance, SHTM has not been complied with. And again, just so I'm understanding things, we've, we've looked at the tender. In addition to the tender document, am I right in thinking that there were some room data sheets that were produced as, as part of tender bids for, for key and generic rooms? There were, yes. And uh, at financial close, we unfortunately didn't get to the production of 100% RDS. Again, we'll, we'll come on and talk about that. But at, mm. at this stage, when the tender goes in, there's certain room data sheets produced by IHSL, key and generic rooms. The idea was that there was meant to be 100% by financial close, but, but that's not achieved. That was the desire, and it was not achieved. I have to say, by mutual agreement and understanding, and it was done on a risk analysis basis. Fundamentally, we had got far enough down the line of mutual understanding that there wouldn't be fundamentals to carry over. But again, I think we need to look at it factually and not with our opinion on it. The list of RDD still to take place after FC was definitively set out in the contract. Perhaps if we could just, just look at the, the contract on, on this mm -hmm. idea of the, the kind of key and generic rooms. So if, if we look at, at bundle five, which is the, the contract that ultimately gets agreed at financial close, and, and look to page 885. You see there's a, a list of key rooms there with, with codes being given. So, for example, B160901, four beds, low acuity. Low acuity yes. That? Then if we skip the next entry, the, the third entry is B140101, single bed cubicle isolation. Do you see that? See that. If we skip the next entry, and then the next entry after that is B160904 beds high acuity. Do you see that? Yes. Yes. So these are, these are some of the key and generic rooms that room data sheets are produced by IHSL and actually included within the contract that gets signed with NHS loading. Is that correct? I understand, yes. If we perhaps just, just look at, at some of those room data sheets. So within bundle five, if we look at page 1010, I should have in the, in the top left hand corner ADB room environmental data and the room is B160901. It's bundle five, page 1010. Bundle five, page 1010. Bundle 5, page 1010. I think we're just having some technical difficulties in terms of, of bringing the, the documents up. Right. Lord Brady, I know that that is 5 to 1. Perhaps we could rise now and just start 5 or 10 minutes earlier before 2 o'clock to try and resolve the, the technical issues. Well, we'll um, do just that. Um, Mr Ballantyne, we usually take a lunch break at 1. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll... Take an hour, uh, and if you are back for um, five to two, that would be excellent. And um, if everyone else was back for five to two, that would be excellent as well. Um, perhaps Mr. Ballantyne can be. Thank you very much.
Please stand.